What I want to talk about today is the 13.7 billion year history of the universe in about 50 minutes. To do this, I have to leave out a lot of details. There are no kings. There are no wars. There are very few uh, people who work in the field in astronomy other than myself who will be described in great detail. But uh, I found that that really speeds things up. <laughs> so uh, as Andy uh, uh, said, uh, I'm at Harvard University on the faculty. I've been on leave for the past year at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which is a scientific uh, foundation on the West Coast, which is a little like the Simons Foundation in supporting basic research. Uh, and I've decided to stay there uh, next year. So uh, I'm going to be, and beyond. So I'm going to be at the Moore Foundation, um, well, without limit of time, but not quite. But anyway, for the foreseeable future. So let's uh, get going. I want to talk about Einstein's blunder undone. So first I have to tell you who Einstein was. No, I don't really have to tell you about that, but I will. I have to tell you what his blunder was which was to invent the cosmological constant, the thing that, makes, uh, that he thought would make a static universe, and then undone. That is, we, it turns out, even though Einstein thought that was a terrible mistake, the universe was not static, that the kind of thing that the cosmological constant is, which to the modern view is that it's a kind of uh, pressure associated with the empty space, uh, is something that we actually need. And so we're going to tell you why we need to undo uh, this blunder. OK, so let's get going. A uh, hundred years ago, astronomers were perfectly confident, as we always are, that we had the whole story. And the whole story was that the Milky Way, the system of stars that we're in, um, was equal to the universe. And here's an image of the Milky Way. There's no place on Earth where you can see this because it has stitched together things that you can see from the southern hemisphere and things that you can see from the northern hemisphere and put them together so you can see what you can never see by yourself. Uh, but you can have an image here that shows you our large flattened system with a bulge in the middle and dust in it. But the most interesting and important parts of this picture are not the most conspicuous ones. Uh, for example, this thing over here is uh, another galaxy, the, Milky Way, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, people get, began to realize that the Milky Way was not alone, that there are other systems equally large, but just so distant that they appeared to be these little um, fuzzy things on the sky, the nebulae. All right. Well, I said this is, starts with Einstein. And of course, one of the great ideas that Einstein had was that the, you can understand uh, gravity uh, as the effect of matter curving space. And the most conspicuous place now where we see that well, in Einstein's day, people looked to see the deflection of light uh, caused by the sun for stars during an eclipse. But uh, today, we use the Hubble Space Telescope, as I show you an image here. These are these systems of stars I'll be talking about, galaxies. And the blue and the red things that you see that are, uh, look like arcs are, in fact, images of similar objects in the background, but which are lensed, or whose light is bent by the presence of the mass in those clusters of galaxies. So uh, people didn't have this picture in Einstein's day, but we do now. And it shows uh, this um, property of mass changing the geometry of space, which is at the basis of general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, a 100-year-old theory. So here's Einstein. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of points about this I'd like to point out. Uh, one is you can see that the person who was sitting next to Einstein left while the shutter was open. And there's a person behind Einstein who's disagreeing with him, shaking his head no. Um, and the, the technological point is interesting. That is that in the old days, we used photographic plates to record light. 
But the modern measurement of light is mostly with electronic devices where the light comes in and it changes something that we can measure uh, in, say, a piece of silicon in a silicon chip. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. Okay, so here's Einstein. And the third technological point I wanted to make is that now we have the ability to look at photographs like this and see what people were thinking. And uh, what Einstein was thinking about the universe was that it must be static, a universe that was not expanding or contracting. He just thought that must be right. Plus, astronomers assured him that the stars of the Milky Way were not approaching us systematically or moving away from us systematically. So he thought, well, it must be static. And that's why he put in by hand this extra term in the uh, equations of general relativity uh, that has the Greek letter lambda associated with it, which is this cosmological constant, this thing that wasn't really in the theory until he put it in, uh, but which works like anti-gravity, like a force against gravity, to make a static universe. That's what he wanted to do. And here he is uh, with Willem van Sitter, uh, uh, one of the distinguished astronomers of the time. De Sitter, one of the distinguished astronomers of the time. So here's what Einstein wrote. Why did I put that in? He said, in, he said uh, uh, this is not justified by our actual knowledge of gravitation. What does he mean by actual? Uh, it is, he says that term, the cosmological term, is necessary only for the purpose of making possible a quasi-static distribution of matter as required by the fact of the small velocities of the stars. When you read learned books on this subject, they often say Einstein had a philosophical approach to this and he liked an eternal and static universe. That may be true, but the argument he gave is that it fits the data. That is, it is as required by the fact of the small velocities of the stars. So he put this term in to make a static universe. Okay, what happened? Well, in the next 10 years, this picture completely unraveled. It turned out that the Milky Way was not the whole universe and that the universe of galaxies that was discovered was not static. And here's the woman who uh, created this revolution in a kind of in a slightly indirect way, Henrietta Leavitt, who worked at the Harvard Observatory. And she noted that there was a certain class of stars that got brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. There were a bunch of them that she was able to study that were all at the same distance. So she knew that the ones that appeared bright were really bright, and the ones that appeared dim were really dim. And she put these two things together, how fast they got bright and dim, which was days or weeks, and how bright they really were. And she said, it is worthy of notice that the brighter variables, she means intrinsically brighter, have the longer periods. And the reason this is important is that when you go out at night and look at the sky, you see some stars are bright and some stars are, dis uh, some stars are dim, but you don't know for sure whether the stars that appear bright are close to you, but intrinsically dim, or very luminous and far away. So you, you can't tell. When you go outside at night, you know there might be a firefly, there might be a planet, there might be an airplane, there might be all those things which appear to be more or less the same brightness, but are at very different distances. And by measuring something that doesn't depend on the distance, namely how long it takes for these stars to vibrate, you can tell which are the 100 watt stars, which are the 50 watt stars, which are the 25 watt stars, and figure out which ones are nearby and which are far away. And the application of that to this problem uh, that's relevant for the discussion this afternoon was done by Edwin Hubble at the world's biggest telescope of the day. This is the 100-inch telescope. Now it's two and a half meters. At the uh, Mount Wilson Observatory above the little village of Los Angeles, and, uh, which had 25,000 people at the time. It was a very dark <laughs> site at Mount Wilson. <laughs> Uh, and you can see it, it has the, the engineering approach, say, of the Titanic, but uh, it has been at a, stayed far from icebergs and uh, is still a working telescope. Now again, the most important thing in the picture is not the obvious thing. It's up here, that's where the astronomer sits. There's a little bentwood chair up there and that platform moves around with the telescope. Here is Edwin Hubble sitting on that chair smoking a pipe, I believe, and uh, operating uh, the telescope. 
And what he did was to look at some of these fuzzy patches, these nebulae, and find the kind of variable star that Henrietta Leavitt had talked about. So here's a plate from a long time ago, a photographic plate from October 6th of 1923. And Hubble uh, noticed he'd had a bunch of these. He'd gone back uh, over and over uh, to look for these variable stars or to look for exploding stars. And he found one of these uh, Cepheid variable stars in, the, um, in this nebula. So then he did the following thing. He compared it to the stars that had the same period in the systems that Henrietta Leavitt had studied. And he realized this was 100 times fainter and therefore must be 10 times as far away. The brightness goes down like the square of the distance. So this was not something in the outskirts of the Milky Way. This was a separate system as big as the Milky Way at a distance which was quite large. The distances uh, between our galaxy and the nearby ones, like this one, are measured in millions of light years. So everybody knows the speed of light is like a metaphor for really fast. Speed of light is a foot. That's a unit of distance that is used in the United States and in Myanmar, and I think possibly Liberia. Anyway, it's a foot in a nanosecond, a billionth of a second. So, uh, we don't see the world the way it really is. We see it the way it was when the light reflected off the things we're seeing out there or was emitted from them. So I see the people in the front, and I see them the way they were, let's say, 10 nanoseconds ago. And curiously, the people in the back appear younger <laughs> because, I, because I see them the way they were when the light was emitted 30 nanoseconds ago. Okay. Just silliness in the room, but in the universe, it's not a joke. And in this way, uh, a telescope is a kind of time machine. It allows us to see light that was emitted at some early time. So when we see distant objects, we're looking into the past. And this will be important because I'm going to talk about the history of cosmic expansion and comparing what the universe was doing back then to what it's doing now by looking at things that are far away compared to things that are nearby. Okay. So uh, people made those measurements for the Milky Way as well and found out how big the Milky Way is. It's about 100,000 light years across, so it takes light about 100,000 uh, years to get across. The stars that you see at night uh, are typically a few light years, up to a few tens or hundreds or even thousands of light years. So when you go outside, you see light that was emitted, let's say, when the Federalists controlled both houses of Congress. Uh, and we, it turns out, by, by mapping out the distribution of matter in the galaxy, we know that we're not at the center. Uh, in fact, this is Fifth Avenue. It's located <laughs> out here, far from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Well, all right. It's just a joke. But uh, we're not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. You probably have heard that the Earth is not the center of the solar system. And this idea that we're not at the center of things uh, is one that I'll come back to in a second. OK, so what are things made of? Well, uh, you know that the world's made of atoms, atoms from the periodic table. We know all of them. Um, and the stars are made of atoms, mostly hydrogen, some helium, and then a pinch of heavier stuff. They're the same atoms as the atoms on the Earth. And the galaxies are made of stars, so they are made of atoms too, only on this bigger scale. Uh, and when you take atoms and you uh, excite them with electricity, they can emit light. So neon light, for example, is, or is a famous kind of light uh, that works that way. Um, when you take the light from a distant star or from a distant galaxy, you can spread it out into a rainbow. And you know what a scientist's job is. It's to take something beautiful and to turn it into a graph. And so uh, up above is the graph that shows you how bright and how dim the light is at each wavelength or each color. And you can see that there, in this lower image, you can see that there are some lines going across the spectrum. Those are called spectral lines. How did that name come about? <laughs> and uh, up at, in the top one, you'll see that there's a dip in the graph at uh, those same locations. Now, the point is that these are exactly uh, the same lines at the same wavelengths uh, as atoms that you can measure in the laboratory. So the, these blue ones down here are from calcium. Uh, there's one from sodium over here, elements that you know 
produce a characteristic emission or absorption. Except oh, what people found when they started measuring the light from galaxies is that you saw the same lines with the same chemistry that we had identified before, except they were stretched out to longer wavelengths, generally speaking, as if the object was moving away from us. And only a few of them are scrunched up toward shorter wavelengths, toward the blue end of the spectrum, uh, because they're approaching us. So here's someone making that measurement, this is the old days, uh, with an instrument that had some prisms in it to measure uh, the spectrum. This is uh, Vesto Melvin Slifer at the Lowell Observatory near Flagstaff. Turns out the Lowells of Lowell House and uh, Amy Lowell, the poet, and uh, uh, President Lowell of Harvard and so on, uh, you know, Percival Lowell thought that there was life on Mars, and so he built an observatory to uh, work on that. Um, and, you know, when there were other things going on, uh, uh, they also measured uh, the spectra of the nebulae, which they thought might possibly uh, be a clue to forming stars and forming planetaries. Anyway, they measured the light. And they found, Slifer found, that uh, mostly the, the objects are moving away from us. Now, uh, the, well, you're familiar with something similar with sound, the Doppler effect. When things are coming toward you, the pitch is higher. When they're going away from you, the pitch is lower. So you know that the sound of a car going by you has a characteristic. It goes, <laughs> so it's pitched up as it's coming toward you, <laughs> and then, as it goes past you, it's pitched lower. The speed of light is a million times the speed of sound, so this effect is much more subtle. Otherwise, when you looked at a highway, you would see blue lights coming toward, well, you do actually, but uh, uh, for a different reason. It has to do with the filters on those tail lights. Anyway, uh, uh, so by 1925, it turns out, Hubble had measured a number of distances, and Slifer had measured couple dozen uh, velocities, and uh, you know, you might wonder why they didn't put two and two together and kind of combine these two things. Uh, and it turns out that Hubble explained that in a kind of psychological physics. He said he had a natural inertia, like so many of my students. He had a natural inertia in the face of revolutionary ideas couched in the unfamiliar language of general relativity discouraged immediate investigation. This is from his book, The Realm of the Nebulae. Whenever he uses the passive voice like that, discouraged uh, immediate investigation, it means by him. Uh, so he did not do this. He had natural inertia. And it, frankly, it's because the mathematics of general relativity is kind of complicated, and it was not part of the training of an astronomer at that time. Okay. But eventually he got uh, onto it, and he plotted the velocity on one axis and the distance on the other. And here's the diagram, which we call a Hubble diagram, which he called figure one. Uh, and what you can see is plotted out this way is distance, up that way is velocity. And it's not a very good relation, but you can see that there is a trend that the velocity that you measure is larger at large distances. And there are only a few objects quite nearby where the, the galaxies, these other galaxies, are approaching us. So what does that mean? Well, Hubble was very cautious. <laughs> he said, gee, I don't really know. But uh, uh, the picture that you might have in your head is the one that many of our students and all the tenured members of the faculty at Harvard have, is that <laughs> they personally are at the center of the universe. And that the galaxy, the rest of the universe, has gotten the message and is moving away from us. This we regard as not correct. And for the same reason that I was talking about a minute ago, we don't think we're at the center of things. We think that we're not at the center of the solar system. The solar system is not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And it would be kind of a willful uh, act of stupidity to think, uh, I mean foolishness, to think that our galaxy was somehow the only one uh, for which this picture would be true. Okay, so how can it be true that you see Hubble's law and that we're not at the center? Well, let me try to convince you or at least uh, give you some inkling of it uh, through the ledger domain of um, animation. So uh, here's, I'm looking at a particular galaxy and all I've done 
is take one picture and make it larger than the next. So all this is is expansion, where I've multiplied the distances by some factor each time. And you can see, if you're thinking about uh, the galaxy that we started with uh, there in the center, that there are some nearby galaxies that moved a short distance, and there are more distant galaxies that moved a big distance, that is, had a bigger velocity away from us. And it turns out that this expansion that I'm talking about uh, is, uh, if you have an expansion like that, it will have Hubble's law. But not just for you. <laughs> It'll be true for everybody, because if you, you picked another galaxy to make your observations from, you'd see everything moving away from it. So if I had the power to make this auditorium bigger, uh, say I could double the size of the auditorium, you'd see the person next to you who was one seat away would end up two, but the person who was 10 seats away would end up 20 seats away in the same length of time. They'd be moving away from you more rapidly if this whole thing was growing and stretching. OK, so the picture we have is that the Hubble's law is telling us about the expansion of the universe. OK, so here's, uh, I said that Einstein had gone to a lot of trouble to make a static universe. And here he is at the telescope. Um, Hubble is hovering to make sure he's in the picture. And uh, this is the observatory director over here looking kind of nervous because, you know, Einstein was not reputed as a great observer and they were worried about him damaging the equipment, I believe. <laughs> Here's another scene where he's more at home. He's uh, in front of the blackboard and he's written some pencer up there and he's uh, standing there with many of the distinguished astronomers, uh, including uh, Edwin Hubble, who's here. Edwin Hubble is being patted on the head by George Ellery Hale, who's the man who built the 100-inch the uh, telescope. He later built the 200-inch telescope. He, in fact, he built the world's largest telescope four times. Anyway, he is approving of, uh, of Hubble's work. So Einstein's in trouble at this point, as you may have gathered. He had gone to a lot of trouble to make a static universe. But the observational evidence in the next 10 years was very clear that we live in a universe that is not only big, so that the Milky Way is not the whole story, but also uh, in motion, uh, expanding. OK, so here's a postcard. You know, with Einstein, everything is being archived, and uh, now anyway. And here's from the ETH. And uh, it says here, let's see, it says, uh, well, if there isn't any quasi-static world, then away with the cosmological constant, something like that. Uh, so Einstein was willing, more or less, to give it up uh, at that point. And in fact, he wrote a paper uh, in which he said, let's not even talk about it anymore. It's not that he would set it to zero. He would leave it out of the equations entirely. OK, but he's not the only person who was uh, doing this work. Here is uh, Willem de Sitter. I showed you his picture before. And here's de Sitter, and you can see he's in the shape of the lambda, the cosmological constant. And he's making the universe swell up. Well, it turns out, uh, everybody knows, English is a dialect of Frisian. That means you can read Dutch. Uh, what makes the ball up? What makes the blows the ball up? What makes the universe expand or upswell, swell up? That has to be lambda. No other answer can be given. So at least some people thought that this lambda, which acts like an anti-gravity, which makes the universe, exp uh, that makes space expand, um, might really be the cause for or the explanation for the expansion of the universe that people were seeing, even in the 1930s. So this is after Hubble's discovery, when they knew that there had to be expansion, and that uh, the lambda, at least for some people, was thought to be a legitimate thing to talk about. Here's the other guy who uh, talked about this, Georges Lemaitre. And he said something that sounds completely modern. He said, everything happens as though the energy in the vacuum would be different from zero. We associate a pressure, P equals minus rho c squared, that's the minus is the important part, to the density of energy rho c squared of vacuum. This is essentially the meaning of the cosmical constant lambda. So it's kind of interesting. Most people gave up on it. Einstein said, don't talk about it. It's poison ivy, terrible idea. Uh, uh, but uh, Lemaitre and a few others stuck with it as a kind of a, something to keep in mind for, uh, uh, for uh, a possible way to understand the history of the universe. Okay, so that's part one. 
an expanding universe. Second part is what you need now is a tool to do the thing that I hinted at uh, a while ago. I said we could measure the expansion nearby by looking at the universe nearby. And we could measure the expansion far away by looking at very distant objects. But you need something like the tool that Henrietta Leavitt had. She had a, those stars whose brightness you could tell from measuring their uh, variability. Turns out there's another kind of star that you can use, which is an exploding star. And these supernovae, these exploding stars, turn out to be pretty good at measuring distances. And even Hubble knew that. In that same book, he said, supernovae can be detected at immense distances. They're a million times brighter than the stars that Henrietta Leavitt was talking about. So you can see them a thousand times as far away. I said that the nearby galaxies were millions of light years away. This means you can measure distances to things that are billions of light years away. Supernovae can be detected at immense distances. And in principle, they are a criterion of distance about as reliable as that of the total luminosities of the nebulae, which is what he was using, Hubble was using, to measure distances. Then he says, actually, however, the maxima are so, so he uh, was one of the first Rhodes Scholars. Uh, and so he, he, although he grew up in Missouri, he came back from Oxford saying things like, actually, forever, uh, however. Actually, however, the maxima are so seldom observed and the supernovae themselves are so rare that they contribute very little to the present problem. So here's the point. That's the observational part was hard because you couldn't find these things. It turns out, I'll show you, they get bright in a couple of weeks. Uh, they're very rare, one in 100 years in a galaxy. And so the problem was to find them. OK, so here's a sped up version of a supernova getting bright and dim from some data we took, uh, uh, a, a frame a night. Uh, so you're seeing a month in the, this little brief sequence. Maybe I'll show it again, because it we had to stay up all night. There you go. So it gets bright, and it gets dim. That time scale is about a month, and it happens about once in 100 years in a, in a big galaxy. Uh, it's happened in our own Milky Way galaxy. So here is a picture taken with an iPhone of Tycho Brahe. <laughs> rushing out of uh, Uraniborg and looking up at the November sky in 1572. And that star wasn't there the year before. Uh, this, this is the thing we call Tycho's uh, supernova. If you look now at the location, which he described very accurately, uh, to see what's there, uh, there is an expanding blob of very hot gas, which is the shredded remains of a star really is the exploding star that became uh, Tycho supernova and was seen 400 years ago. OK, so there is a phenomenon. There's exploding stars. Uh, they are very bright. And it turns out, with the appropriate uh, work, you can use them to measure uh, distances. You should be interested in supernovae, partly because they're fantastic things, but also because you're made of the elements that are created in supernova explosions. So, I said that the stars, we know what the stars are made of. It's mostly hydrogen and helium with a pinch of other stuff. But that other stuff came from somewhere. And the place where the iron that's in your blood and the calcium that's in your bones and the oxygen that you're breathing, the, where, the place where those atoms came from was from generations of stars that uh, lived and died before the formation of the sun. And we can see that in action here. This uh, turns out we can measure the chemistry of these things. This is mostly iron. That is uh, the result of carbon and oxygen um, burning in nuclear fusion. OK, so when you look at uh, uh, this uh, beautiful thing and you ask, where did this beautiful thing come from? Uh, uh, you might say, well, Pontiac, Michigan. Everybody knows that. Uh, but when I see that car, I think it was manufactured in supernovae five billion years ago. OK, okay so we have these things, these kind we call type 1a supernovae. It turns out they're about four billion times as bright as the sun, so we can see them at tremendous distances. But they're rare. There's only about one in a century in a galaxy. So I said there have been supernovae in the Milky Way galaxy, but you haven't seen one because <laughs> there hasn't been one since uh, one seen since Kepler's time. OK. And I said that uh, with the appropriate uh, 
corrections, they can be used very well to make uh, a Hubble diagram, measure distances. And so here's velocity going up this way, distance going out that way, the way Hubble did it. Um, and you can, these are, every black dot is a supernova. And you can see this is a lot better diagram than the one that he had uh, back in 1929. In fact, Hubble's Hubble diagram would fit in that little, in, fit in that little red square down there at the bottom. So he had this problem, but just by the toenail, uh, back in 1929. And you can see that this relation between velocity and distance looks pretty good. The velocity up here is 30,000 kilometers a second. That's a tenth of the speed of light. And the distance out here is about 2 billion light years. So that's what we would call you know, nearby. Uh, and the question is, whether the expansion that you see nearby, by looking at bright supernovae, is the same or different from the expansion that you measure in very distant supernovae to see what the history of cosmic expansion has been. Because what you would like to know is whether the expansion of the universe has been slowing down due to the presence of gravity in it or something else. By the way, it's something else. <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, I just want to say a word about those exploding stars, because there might be someone here who works in my field. And you know I wanted to be sure to have something new for them. Uh, all right, so uh, Arthur Daniel Eddington, sort of the leading uh, theoretical uh, astro astronomer of the 20, early 20th century, said, it is a good rule not to put over much confidence in the observational results that are put forward until they are confirmed by theory. And I want to show you. <laughs> that even though we have shown that the supernovae are very good empirical tools, and we've sharpened them up so they really work, there are a few unsolved problems that uh, we've made a little progress on in the last uh, year. OK, so here's the uh, technical thing, which is that we think these stars, when, when they explode, are what we would call a white dwarf. They're stars which are left over after nuclear burning. They're very dense. They're very small. The sun will become a white dwarf. Uh, after it swells up and becomes a red giant and evaporates the Earth, but never mind that. Uh, it'll become one of these dense things about the size of the Earth, but with the mass of the Sun. And this graph shows you uh, on the horizontal axis, it's the white dwarfs of different masses. And up this way is the radius, the size of the star. And you can see, and here's the Earth to the same scale. So uh, this, that funny little symbol there means solar masses. So for Four tenths of a solar mass, the white dwarf would be bigger than the Earth. At eight tenths, just about the same, 1.2 smaller. And you notice it's going towards zero. This is really kind of, this was a shocking thing to Eddington and to others in the 30s. That idea that there could somehow be a star which would disappear uh, if it got massive enough. And um, we're all in the age where we think nothing of talking about black holes, but at that time, um, this was considered quite a scandalous uh, result. But that's all right. The question is really what happens uh, to a star and how does it get to the uh, somewhere near this uh, limiting mass of about 1.4 solar masses. The star is being held up by quantum mechanics, by the degeneracy, the fact that you cannot put all the electrons in the same state. They resist that and they can push back. Um, but something funny must happen around 1.4 solar masses, that's for sure. Now what we think happens is that there's an explosion. These stars are made of carbon and oxygen. If it gets hot enough and dense enough, you can have nuclear fusion in which they burn to make uh, iron. And that, we think, is the story of the type 1 supernovae, as I said so glibly about 10 minutes ago when we were looking at Tycho stars. But how do you get there? We think it happens in a binary system, two stars. So that there's an ordinary star pouring mass onto the white dwarf, and that that produces the explosion. Or you could have two white dwarfs, and they could whirl around and collide with one another. And uh, if you had an audience of supernova experts here, they would be divided on this question, I'm sorry to say. So the thing that lies at the basis of um, what I'm going to claim, that we see the history of cosmic expansion and we can measure the presence of dark energy, has this embarrassing fact that 
at the basis of it, we're not sure whether it's two white dwarfs or a white dwarf and a regular star. And it would be really good to find out. Oh, there are even systems with three stars. Never mind that. <laughs> uh, and so it's a big deal because Adam Rees will have to give back his Nobel Prize uh, if it turns out that we have really messed up this measurement. He liked to spell his name clearly, and that's what he was doing for the king of Sweden. OK, um, so what's the story? The story is when you look at exploding stars, here's another supernova remnant, you don't see that companion. Where, where did it go? You know, if they were in this do -si do and one of them exploded, the other one should be zooming off. And we should see those. We don't see them. If you look at the most nearby galaxies where there's been a supernova explosion, here's one. Uh, in a galaxy uh, M101. Um, you can look in great detail, and uh, as early as we can uh, do it, you can't see any companion. However, oh, and there's more. Uh, and uh, here's a, a paper that says, no signature of ejecta interaction with the stellar companion in three type 1a supernovae. Very nice modern measurements. So I'm, what I'm here today to tell you is, there's one case, and I'm going to show it to you. So the pendulum was swinging toward this idea that there were two uh, white dwarfs. But here, we gratefully acknowledge support from the Simons Foundation. That's very good. Uh, and uh, here's the paper. So supernova such and such, evidence for interaction between a normal type 1a supernova and a uh, binary companion. Hey, I'm on there. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, and uh, what's so interesting is this is something that had been anticipated. People had looked into this, doing numerical computations uh, of the type that might be done here at the Simons Foundation uh, in coming years when David Spurl shows up. So, but this is by Dan Kazin uh, at Santa Cruz some years ago. And he was thinking, how could you tell if it was one star or two? two. And the answer is, if the other star was an ordinary star. When the explosion took place, it would hit it and heat it up. And uh, here's his computation. On the left, this yellow thing is supposed to be the exploding star blasting out. The blue thing is the neighbor getting hit. Uh, the colors are measuring, are showing you density. And that black line is supposed to show you the region that's really hot, uh, hot enough to emit uh, in the ultraviolet. And then this progresses for a while, and uh, the supernova will eventually envelop the neighbor star, and then the effects won't be so conspicuous. So the idea is for a few days, you might have a little blue flash due to the neighbor star. And here are some graphs that show that. Uh, over here, this one up here is maybe the most fun. This says ultraviolet, so very blue light. If there's no companion, it ought to follow that black line. And then if there are different kinds of stars, the green line is if the neighbor is very, big, very swelled up. The blue line is if it's about six solar masses. The red line is if it's a two solar masses. OK. Uh, so now I'm sure you're uh, wondering, are there any objects for which this has been seen? Why, yes. Uh, here it is. Um, these are. The uh, measurements of it getting bright and dim, this is the supernova from 2012. And it's by looking carefully at these measurements very early. Uh, this is about uh, two weeks before the explosion. And it's, the diagram's a little bit of a mess. But what you can see is that for an ordinary supernova, these diamonds go up that way toward being red early and uh, blue later. But for our, the one that we measured, which is all this junk here, uh, you can see that it doesn't go that way. It goes the other way. And it's in the vicinity of these models that were calculated in advance for the impact of the explosion on an ordinary nearby star. So I think there's at least one case uh, where this story that we've been telling, and in fact, that I put on the exam in my course. You know, what makes a type 1a supernova? You had to answer that correctly. It looks like a, there's at least one case where the story that we were saying uh, might be correct. <laughs> OK, so here's Einstein. And uh, if you go to the National Academy, there's Einstein out in front of the National Academy. He's got this tablet that he brought down from the mountain. And on it, uh, there's a familiar equation, e equals mc squared. Everybody knows that one. 
The one above is the one that describes uh, the interaction of a photon with uh, a material. Remember I talked about measuring the light with, uh, the, um, with silicon, and this is related to that. And the top one is the more complicated equation for general relativity. No lambda term in there. Einstein did not want that in there. Einstein's original gravity equation, that's without uh, the cosmological constant, was correct, says George Gamow. Uh, not a reliable source, actually. But anyway, he says uh, Einstein's original gravity equation was correct. Changing it was a mistake, says Gamow. Much later, when I was discussing cosmological problems with Einstein, uh, George, I'm sorry to say my book does not have any uh, discussions between me and Einstein. I'm, anyway. Much later, when I was discussing cosmological problems with Einstein, he remarked that the introduction of the cosmological term was the biggest blunder he ever made in his life. But this blunder, rejected by Einstein, is still sometimes used by cosmologists even today. And the cosmological constant denoted by the Greek letter lambda rears its ugly head again and again and again. OK, George, calm yourself. George Gamow, I'm talking to. All right. So uh, what's the story on this? Well, if there is a cosmological constant, it would produce an accelerating universe, a universe that gets faster uh, over time. And by using the supernovae to measure the history of cosmic expansion at great distances, we can see whether that's true or not true. OK, so all you have to do is take a I said these, uh, the galaxies have a supernova once every 100 years. So you just have to have a graduate student work for 100 years looking at one galaxy. OK, they won't do that. Have them look at 1,000 galaxies, and you know they ought to find one uh, in a few months. They won't do that either. But what they will do, and what uh, Brian Schmidt is here explaining to his thesis advisor, what they will do is write a computer code that will do that problem. So take an image, compare it to another image by subtraction, in fact and uh, uh, see if you can see uh, a new supernova. So here's the idea. Uh, suppose you took a picture tonight, and it looked like this. This is about 1 1,000th of the image area of the detectors that we use, the silicon detectors we use. And uh, you will have one from last month. The supernova gets bright in a couple of weeks, so it could be in the picture tonight and not in the picture last month. And then you subtract them. So they're, these are digital images. You put them in a computer. You subtract them. And uh, you'll find that there's a dot left over in the object because there's more light here. It's kind of hard to see it there, but there's an actual dot that is new in the middle picture. Plus, the software puts a red circle around it, so that really helps a lot. OK, so uh, that's one part, searching lots of supernovae. The other is. I mentioned that our galaxy has dirt in it. Other galaxies have dust in it. And since you're judging the distance to things by their apparent brightness, that could be a source of error. Because you might find that uh, an object was dim because of dust instead of dim because of its real distance. That would mess you up. Uh, so I had another student. Here is uh, Adam Reese. And uh, it's on the day that he did his thesis exam, I think. Uh, and that's me wearing all the answers on that, uh, on that vest uh, to uh, try to take into account the effects of dust. So we had those two things. Uh, we had um, a way to find the supernovae and a way to measure them very accurately. And we were able to search for this effect that I mentioned. Here's how it would work. If the universe is uh, slowing down, then when you look at supernovae that are um, nearby compared to the ones that, well, the, the supernovae nearby compared to the ones far away uh, will bear the uh, signature of that. Here's the idea. While the light is in flight from the distant ones to you, if the universe is accelerating, that distance will end up being bigger. If the universe is decelerating, that distance will end up being smaller, and the supernova will appear brighter. So it's by measuring whether they're a little brighter or a little dimmer uh, compared to the nearby ones that you'll find out which way things are going. So Adam, who was a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, knows you have to keep a lab notebook. 
and here's his lab notebook, and he was working out how much mass there would be slowing down the universe, and you can see he got a number that was negative, minus 0.36, and he called me up and he said, gee, I'm getting negative mass. I said, well, you must have made a mistake because everybody knows it's got to be positive, otherwise there would be a cosmological constant. And he said, oh yeah, good point. So anyway, he went back and looked at it again. Uh, other, the rest of our team looked at it, and we could not find any mistake. So we stuck with it, and we realized that what this was showing is that the distance was stretching out a little faster, the supernovae were, the universe really was accelerating. Okay, well Einstein was surprised, that's for sure. Uh, and you can see now when he walks around, he carries a sheaf of papers that includes something, a term that begins with lambda, so, you know, he's hedging his bets, so I can tell you. Uh, so that was a big surprise. That was in 1998. Um, and uh, here's another uh, set of observational discoveries. Galileo said, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. But I'm going to give you the opportunity to discover it. So here, oh, oh no. In a minute, I'll give you the opportunity. So here we are. Uh, this is in the, uh, Jane took this picture. This is in the uh, uh, lobby at the Grand Hotel in, uh, in Stockholm. The guys are going to go get their prizes. Here they are, getting their prize. Good. Uh, let me show you the modern data. Uh, we haven't stopped. We didn't stop then. So here's the modern data. I showed you some points before. Now here's a lot more points over a much bigger range in distance. And we ask the question, does it show the universe speeding up or slowing down? The answer is speeding up. Uh, and you can do the measurement yourself. Um, so as uh, here's a modern set of data. And the question is, which of these lines fits best? Well, not that one. Oh, not that one. Better, 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 better. Oh, pretty good, pretty good. Oh, yeah. Uh, it turns out. For the one that is just about right, is the universe is three quarters in the form of the dark energy, and only about one quarter in the form of gravitating stuff. Three quarters in the form of something we understand very poorly, and only one quarter in the form of something we understand a little better. So uh, the data now are really good. It's not hard to see that you have to have something like this uh, uh, dark energy, as we call it, something like the cosmological constant that makes the universe speed up over time. Okay, well, let me, let me just proceed. So here's the picture we have now. The atoms of the periodic table in all the stars and all the galaxies, everywhere we look, are about 4% of the total stuff in the universe. Um, this other thing that's green here, I don't know how we know it's green, is the what we call the cold dark matter, that stuff that is not in the periodic table because if it were made of ordinary neutrons and protons, it would have messed up the cooking of, um, of atoms in the Big Bang itself. We're pretty sure that's right, but we know it must be there because it is, uh, we see the uh, uh, gravitational effects of this matter, but it, it's not the ordinary atoms. And 73%, something like that, is in the dark energy. Now, some people look at this and say, that does not look good. Uh, I look at this and say, first of all, I like being part of the 4%. That's good. Uh, secondly, uh, that this shows that there is plenty more to do because we do not know what the dark, cold dark matter is, and we do not know what the dark energy is. So the opportunity for future work is really good. <laughs> 96% of the universe, not in a known form. Okay, so the history of the universe is kind of a tug of war between gravity trying to slow things down and uh, the dark energy speeding things up. The density of matter has gone down over time and the balance in this tug of war has changed. So the universe was slowing down and is now uh, speeding up. Okay, so what is the dark energy? Well, in the old days you could Google dark energy without getting uh, a highly uh, uh, crafted uh, scientific explanation from an academic institution. Instead, you got this from American Hydroponics. They were selling plant food, which uh, uh, it's no accident that this was in Berkeley, California. This is plant food so you can grow 
uh, controlled substances in your closet. Uh, <laughs> and they said, uh, these specialized processes are also responsible for the very distinct odor of dark energy. So we don't know what it is, but we know it smells bad. OK, so how do you think about this? For the dark matter, um, if you look at a mountain range in the uh, moonlight, and you see the outline of the mountains, what you're seeing is not the mountain. What you're seeing is the snow on the mountain. So when we look at galaxies out in the universe, we're not seeing the matter that is <laughs> making them clump up. We're seeing, like the frosting on the cake or like the snow on the mountains, we're seeing the thing that we can see, but it's not the thing that's giving form to the universe. Similarly, when you look out and you see the trees moving around, and somebody says, well, what's doing that? Everybody knows the answer is the wind. But you don't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. You see how it makes things change. And so it sounds kind of sophisticated, especially when you show arty pictures. But uh, it's for real that the presence of these things is uh, for sure, but we don't see them. So even though we don't see them, uh, we're quite sure that they're there and that they're acting to make the universe um, that we see. OK, let me just say a few words about the future. Uh, of course, we're not going to give up and say, well, we just don't know. Uh, we're going to try to find out. Um, I have a program on the Hubble Space Telescope where we're measuring supernovae uh, with, at wavelengths where the dust is less of an effect. And I think that that will give us a better clue to what the dark energy is. We're going to build the, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which will be very good at working uh, at high redshift and in the infrared. And that's going to be launched in a few years as a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. We're trying to build big telescopes on the ground. At the Moore Foundation, I'm involved in the work on this one, the 30-meter telescope uh, that we're uh, uh, designing and building. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> a little advertising. And what will that do? Um, if we uh, use the right kinds of techniques to cancel out what the atmosphere is doing, we'll get much sharper images than we can do even with the Hubble Space Telescope. And because the telescope is so large, it will be able to collect light from very much fainter objects. So this whole area of study is going to be something that these new instruments will help uh, make happen. OK, so finally, uh, why are we doing science, you know? Uh, when you, when you uh, talk to people who are interested in the practical part of it, uh, like congressmen, uh, it's often good to emphasize things that I mention up here, like uh, technology, you know, that's good, and uh, it's a dangerous world, so it's important to have defense, and people buy that. Uh, a lot of the Congress people are uh, interested in living into the next year, and so medicine is a good thing. I'm in favor of all these things. I think it'd be good to be rich and safe and immortal. Uh, but I don't think that's the whole story. And that there is a reason for doing this kind of science, because you don't want to be rich, safe, immortal, and bored. Uh, that people are curious. We want to know where we came from. We want to know where we're going. We want to know what the world is made of. Uh, and at least some science ought to be done for the joy of finding out how the world works. Thank you very much. <laughs>